Jambo. Sabati njema. Habari asubuhi. It is good to be back home in Kenya. And I sincerely mean that. It's good to be alive. I don't know the the devil had a plan, but God had a counter plan. I guess some of you may have heard that I had some issues getting here on time. In previous times, I would come from the United States and I'd land at your, your airport, your big airport, Jumo Kenyatta. And all I'll have to do is present $50 and they'll give me the visa. And I took it for granted that the same pertained to this time. So I am now residing in Johannesburg. And I said, Africa, Africa, no problem. <laughs> so I got there at the airport in time to catch the flight at 1220 on Thursday. I said I wanted to get here a day two days ahead of time so I could get relaxed. Then they told me I need an e-visa. I said, what's that? And they said, you have to have it. I said, no, no, I always been able to use my US passport, come in. They said, that's ancient history. And so I could not get onto that flight at 1220. I could not get onto the flight at five o'clock. And then I took Brother Malmani and Chief Andrew and Pastor. I left at 1 a.m. on Friday morning. But thank God I got here on time. Man proposes, but God disposes. Man initiates, but God regulates. Kenyans, God's always in charge. Come on, talk to me. God's always in charge. Amen. And I'm happy to be here today with you. I bring you greetings from my conference president, Pastor Peter Malagutu, who's the president of the Northern Conference in Johannesburg. Very dynamic little man. And I'm presently the pastor, pastor of Santon. It's a D, but a T is silent. Santon, Santon Seventh-day Adventist Church. Santon Church is one of the most popular churches in South Africa. And it sits on the most, they claim, the South Africans claim, that it's the most expensive piece of real estate. It's the Wall Street of South Africa. And we have a very vibrant congregation. And as I was telling your pastor, now in my... I consider myself a senior citizen. I may not look like it, but I consider myself a senior citizen. I believe that God has brought me there to this time. We have a very, very nice congregation. And I'd like to tell you something. South Africans can sing. Lord have mercy. They can worship. And we have a good time every Sabbath. I told them last Sabbath I was coming to Kenya. I said, Kenyans are the most hospitable people that I've ever embraced. I know because I've come here lots of times. And I have received your warm hospitality. I said, but they can't sing like you. So that's what I told them. But by the way, I'm happy to be home. I'm happy to be home. I have good friends. And here, your pastor, Pastor Jacob Akali is my brother friend and I ask you to treat him as one of yours come on church Amen. love him to death he and his family I think this is the fourth time I'm preaching for you Alpecia Lavington yes that place way 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 there yes central church yes and now here but preceding you I preached at this church 
in 30 years ago when you were in the city hall. Anybody remember that? Some of you weren't born. I was pastoring at Barreton as the pastor and chaplain. And my good brother and friend, Dr. and Mrs. Wangai, invited me. They were in that theater. Is that theater? Yes. Yes, and I preached there for the first time. And then Brother Moses reminded me I preached there 13 years ago. So God has a plan. Three times, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So I'm happy to be back here today with you. I trust and pray and hope as we tabernacle this week. I bring to you a Christ-centered ministry. At Santon, I preach nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because Jesus says, if you lift me up, I'll draw all persons. Don't leave out the children. God says, if you lift me up, I'll draw all men and women and children unto me. And I, as I've gotten older, now I'm a grandfather of a 15-year-old and 11-year-old. By the way, my 15-year-old granddaughter, Aurora, she thinks she knows more than me. So I listen to her these days, and I'm wise enough not to challenge her. You know, women can change the stories on you in the middle of the story. <laughs> so I do not fight her, I listen. And as I used to challenge my father, she will understand father time and the mother nature will take care of her wisdom. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find. Don't rush it. Trust in me, my Father's eyes bestowed. Sing with me, church. I've no cause for your fulfillment. He whose heart it is kind of beyond all measure gives unto each day that he deems best lovingly. It's part of pain and pleasure. church every day the Lord himself is in me with a special mercy for each child all my cares if they Take us 
May the solemn words of this gospel hymn be the sentiment and the longing of every precious heart. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so kindly. I forgot to mention that um, I, I did not arrive. By the way, I observed that, Pastor, that there are a lot of good-looking people in this church. And those who are not good-looking are looking good. <laughs> amen, amen. But when I arrived, that they wasn't looking as good as I'm looking now. I want to thank my good sister and friend, Sister Terry Mungai, who got me a good facial and a good haircut. Sister Terry, are you there somewhere? Would you? Yes, 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 yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Ashley's, I'm advertising. I know it's a Sabbath, but yeah, it's a good place to go. Thank you so very kindly. My, our head elder and elders, our board of elders, have asked me to, grant, to greet you on behalf of their pastor. And they said they don't believe in sheep stealing. They don't believe in sheep stealing. In other words, don't steal me. Send me back. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Our head elder especially says that she's praying for us. Yes, our head elder is a woman. And I have discovered the older I get, I stay closer to women leaders. They know all the nooks and crannies, the wisdom that that lady brings to our congregation, it's a blessing. Gentlemen, you're quiet, but it's the truth. <laughs> yes, Dr. Mercy Mapegjinjira from Malawi. And she's our head elder. She's the dean of humanities at the University of Johannesburg. And she is my psychic. I'm a better pastor after listening to her counsels. Hello, new life. Yeah. Yes. God loves everybody. I've given, today I'd like us to open our Bibles to John chapter 4. And I'd like to read in your hearing just a few verses. And then we'll get into the word. Into the message. I'll read from verses... 1 to 8 as the scriptural backdrop for a message today. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John the baptizer. Though Jesus himself did not baptize them. His disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria. He said, I must go through Samaria on the way to Galilee. And eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus tired from the long walk, the three-day journey, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples, he sent them into town, into the village to buy some food. My brothers and sisters of this new life encampment, before I talk with you, let us talk with God. Heavenly Father, Thank you for traveling mercies. 
Thank you for a good night's sleep. Thank you for a healthy breakfast. Thank you for traveling mercies to this place. Thank you for the good music that has prepared our hearts. Now bless us. Remove Parkinson. And may Christ be seen, be experienced, and heard. In Jesus' name. Amen. I've given title to what I hope to consider for the next little while, One Woman's Witness. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of that woman, who testified, he told me all that I ever did. My brothers and sisters of New Life, visiting friends, there is in Samaria an ancient spring which across the ages has been known as Jacob's Well. Truth be told, thank you, I have never been to that well, but those of my colleagues who have gone to the Bible lands who have, they have attested and they've told me that they have tasted the water and they've found it to be cool and refreshing. Vital and significant to the history of the Hebrews is the existence of certain wells. During the nomadic period of their history, the years of their wandering, the years of their moving from place to place, it was necessary for the Hebrews to build certain wells as we do here in Africa, as they journeyed from place to place. Jacob was a well digger. His father Isaac before him was a great digger of wells. In those days where many of the lands where those feet sat down, water was scarce and therefore a most precious commodity. Water was so scarce and so precious in some places that herdsmen, shepherds, fought over wells. At one period in Isaac's life, the Bible says that he had to relocate several times in a short period of time because of envy and jealousy surrounding his wells. King David, you remember, had a great affection for a certain well, and the psalmist one day, in the midst of great weariness and terrible exhaustion, David said to his men, Oh, that someone would give me to drink from the well that is by the sheep gate of Bethlehem. Wells, my brothers and sisters of new life, are ancient in their origin, and even in our day and time here in Africa, scattered places you can draw fresh water from old wells. From my own childhood experience, you see I am a dual citizen. My mother's from Guyana, South America. My father's African-American. I can recall vividly certain wells that are fed from underground springs. And sometimes on a clear, hot summer day in my mind's eye, I can find myself longing for a drink from one of those old well springs 
in Guyana. Jacob's well in Sychar of Samaria enjoys a very prominent and, how can I put this, conspicuous place in history. Not because of the quality of its water, but rather because, hear me today, not because of the quality of its water, but rather because of what our Lord Jesus did at that well one day. Can I preach this thing? En route from Judea to Galilee, the field preacher from Nazareth emphatically told his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. Can I make it plain? Talk to me. I like a, preacher, a congregation that talks to me. Can I make it plain? You see, the Jews and the Samaritans were cousins. They were related. But the Jews, they, the Samaritans were a, a, a mixture of Jews and other nationalities. Therefore, the Jews felt that they had lost that rich cultural heritage that the Jews claimed to have. And so the Jews and the Samaritans, though related, never got along. As a matter of fact, Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans despised Jews. And whenever a Jew would be walking along a road and a Samaritan would come, he would go on the other side of the road and he'd spit behind him. That was the antipathy and the dislike that the Jews had for Samaritans. And therefore, it was normally a three-day journey from Galilee to Samaria, Samaria. So the Jews would rather take that long six-mile walk so they would not touch Samaritan territory. Are we together? Come on, relax, relax. I see some of you relax. Just relax. Chill. I'm going somewhere. This is the word of God. Somebody say amen. amen. And so my brothers and sisters, Jesus said to his disciples, let's take the short term, just three days. I must go through Samaria. I need to. No, 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 no. And he said to his men, when they came to the village of Sychar, a place resting at the foot of Mount Gerizim, the master was now tired and weary from that three day foot journey, sat down at Jacob's well. Now, I believe that when John wrote this, he took his time and mentioned everything. It is not by purpose that Jesus sent his disciples into town to buy food. He sent them away. It went over somebody's head. He sent them into town to buy food. And the Bible says it was a terribly hot day the blistering sun being down with its scorching rays. It was a hot day in Samaria. The sun was in its meridian splendor. At high noon, it happened. Along the dusty road leading to Jacob's well, there came a woman with her water pot. She came, the Samaritan woman came, to draw fresh water from Jacob's old well. She was alone, and so was Jesus. She did not realize it. But it was prime time on God's schedule. Somebody didn't hear me. 
You see, in the original language of the New Testament, the New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic. And in the Greek, there are two words for time. How many words? Two words. The word kairos and chronos. Chronos is the instrument that chronos is the, 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 the word from which you get chronometer. Chronometer is an instrument used for measuring time. But it was not chronos. It was kairos. Kairos is God's time. Eternity. It was prime time. God's time, not clock time. For the infinite was about to intersect the finite. Two people met at a well. Two distinct personalities. One a man and one a woman. And by the way, by the way, in the Jewish law and tradition, a man must not, was not supposed to talk to a woman in public, not even his wife. Not even a rabbi. We'll deal with that later. Two people met at the well. Two distinct personalities. One a man and one a woman. I see the men looking at me cross-eyed. Come on, relax. An extraordinary man. And a most unusual woman. I am talking church. I am talking about a seeking shepherd. And a lost sheep. It was prime time I tell you. It was a chironic moment. It was a rare and exceptional situation. My brothers and sisters of new life. Seldom it was. That anybody caught Jesus alone. But that was not her purpose. She did not know the value of seeing Jesus alone. For she didn't know who he was. But that reality, that reality enhanced the significance of the encounter. Can I preach this? Help me. Or should I say amen and sit down? That reality enhanced. She didn't know who he was. But here was the all-knowing alone with the unknowing. In a sense, face to face with awful guilt. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when that kind of aloneness come together, it always presents marvelous possibilities. Two strangers met in absolute silence. And then he who came from yonder eternity, he breaks the silence with a simple request. Give me a drink. That's all he said. That's what he said. Give me a drink. And that simple request, that simple statement, that simple, solemn, sincere request set in motion the most fascinating and the most sweeping and the most piercing dialogue in all of Jesus' three-year ministry. And you know, my brothers and sisters, our God does not have to say much to get things moving. God doesn't have to make long speeches. Come on church, say amen. amen. No, he doesn't. For when out of chaos was converted into an orderly cosmos in the beginning of time, God simply said, let there be light. And there was light. Isn't that right? God doesn't have to say a lot. He doesn't have to work by science. He just have to blow. 
and instantly 40 meters of rain would appear on the ground and, it wouldn't, and people can't say anything about it. Jesus simply said, give me a drink. And that started a conversation. And this is the meat of my message. I'm getting to it. That started a conversation that ran the gamut from politics, hello, to international relations, to racism, to tribalism. to water science, to history, to theology, to morality, to geography, and finally to salvation. Here a single solitary woman, alone at Jacob's well, stimulated the most comprehensive conversation that Jesus ever engaged in in his earthly ministry. And when it ended, she forgot what she came for. She forgot her water pot. And she left it at the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says, John says, finally, she became an astounding missionary with a message. The Bible says she ran into the busy city streets and said to everybody who looked tall, huh? Is that what they said? She said there's somebody who looked short, somebody who was light skinned. No. She said to everybody she saw, come, see a man. And that, here, hear me, hear me. You know how we are. This is a woman, right? And you know her history, right? You know her history. She said, come see what? Would you go? But that's not all John said. That she said. She said, come, see a man who told me everything that I ever did. Come, come with me, everybody. Let's go to Jacob's well. You better come on now. Go to Jacob's well. Something is happening in Samaria. There's a new man in town. And he must be the Messiah. Come see this man. And, and the Bible says that many of the citizens of this town and the Samaritans of that city believed on Jesus because of the word of this woman when she declared, he told me everything that I ever did. And my brothers and sisters, that was the outstanding result of one woman's witness. Turn to your neighbor, just say one woman's witness. Okay, shut up and listen to me now. This woman was alone with her story. She was a soloist, if you please. She had no supporting cast. She had no, what did the thing this girls play? No violin. She, she didn't have a praise team. All she had was her incredible story. And she had a story to tell. And she told her story well. You know, it's amazing, my brothers and sisters, the, what just one solitary soul who really and truly believe in Lord Jesus Christ and who sure enough trust his grace, what that person can do with the assistance of God Almighty. I'm learning more and more as I grow older every day 
waiting to sit in my rocking chair, that it doesn't have to take a large crowd or a huge army to do great things under God. Sometimes a crowd can get in the way of progress. Come on now. You ever sit in a large church board? Huh? Hello? I have one in Sandton. And they used to meet for five hours before I got there. And now we meet for between an hour and a half to two hours and we get the business done. Sometimes a crowd can stymie progress. Come on, churches, say amen. Sometimes they can stifle success. Oh, my brothers and sisters, sometimes if you have too many people, they have a tendency to get in each other's way. Are you acquainted with that old proverbial saying, too many cooks spoil the soup? Same it is in God's service. One sincere witness can set a town for fire and turn the town around for God completely. Hear me, church. It was one Rahab who made possible the successful escape of Joshua's spies in Jericho, and they in turn saved our whole family. It is one little woman in the history of, Amer of black America who named Sojourner Truth, who sent thousands of slaves from the Southland of Promise into Canada. It was one Esther. Come on, can I preach it? It was one Esther who delivered her people from political tyranny. I tell you, church, one woman, one soul, one man, one child born of God and trusting in his goodness can bring God's blessings to a multitude. No church, this woman. Can I, can I leave John now? Can I leave John? Can I walk down your, church, your, your pathway? Can I walk, come to your house? Can I knock on your door? Pastor, can I knock on your door? Put on your seatbelt. This woman of Samaria, to be certain, had to deal daily with certain difficulties. For hers, when she became a missionary, it was no easy task. For her past presented a problem. She had what was considered a questionable and a rather clandestine history. You know, gentlemen, I'm talking to men now. This lady must have been exceedingly, distractingly attractive. Can I say it again? This woman, I get the men attention now, you see, they wake up. This woman must have been exceedingly, distractingly attractive. For she had managed to have five husbands and was presently living with another man who was not her husband. But you know, church, when a woman like that becomes a missionary, eyebrows are raised. And the church business meeting gets the largest turnout. Uh, if you can't say ouch, say amen. If you can't say amen, say oh me. Yes. You know when a woman like this, eyebrows are raised and gossip makes the rounds. You know brothers and sisters, there's nothing new under the sun. That's the way people were back then, in Jesus' day. That's the way people are right now in Nairobi. There's nothing new under the sun. Oh, notable church apologist George Buttrick once said, human beings haven't really changed, only their clothing is up to date. And that doesn't stay up to date for long. For if you hold on to the clothing that your dad used to wear, it will come back in style again. Isn't that right? 
Yes, it will come back in style again. I reiterate, there is nothing new under the sun. People are still cruel. I'm talking about in the church. People are still cruel. People are still mean. Some people, I have pastored some people so mean that they give Panadol a headache. Heartless and lacking in love and compassion. Even people in the church who are always ready to talk about the power of God. They often act surprised when God works a miracle and turns somebody's life around. If you can't say amen, say ouch. Because I declare to you today, I didn't come here to entertain you, but I want you to know, my God I serve can still change lives. Amen. The God I serve can still clean up dirty characters. The God I serve can straighten up crooked lives. If I didn't believe that, I'll stop preaching right now. God cannot only make water into wine. He can make drunkards give up water give up wine for water listen to me new life don't you count anybody out in this church you see you hear that amen how quiet it is don't you count anybody out and you know one of the reasons why old people are so hard and young people would you like to know i thought you would they don't have the strength and the powers to do the things they want to do I discovered some years ago while I was driving, I was pastoring in the state of Michigan, the United States, and on and, and Sunday mornings there's a gospel radio station on, and this, there's a, this station, they were singing this song, and this, the lines of this song attracted me right away. It says that the only time you have the right to look down on anybody is when you're trying to lift them up. Here, church, if you miss anything I say during this encampment, don't miss this. Don't you relegate anybody to the junk pile. And whatever you do, don't you reject anybody whom God has touched and blessed. Come on, church, say amen. For when God has touched somebody's life, you ought to thank God. And you ought to put your arm around that somebody and share together with them in the joy of God's salvation. Hear me, church, today. That one woman, in spite of her shady past, in spite of the snares and the jeers and the gossip, she proceeded to tell her story. And she was honest. And the capsule of her testimony was, he told me everything that I ever did. He didn't cover up, and he didn't let me cover up. I was traveling in New York one time. I was pastoring in Michigan. And Michigan to New York, at, at least by driving, is 14 hours. And I was in New York. Where was pastoring? Where was pastoring? I was in New York. I was in the subway. And I saw one of my deacons in the subway. He was smoking. Where was I pastoring? Where was he? He didn't expect to see me. He was smoking. And when he saw me, he took the cigarette and put it in his pocket. I say, hey, brother, what's happening? You know, we tried to talk and you know, he couldn't move and, you know. But I'm saying that story is only known to him, me, and God. Are you listening to me? You don't always have to be judgmental. Don't you count anybody out. This woman said, he didn't cover up. And he didn't let me cover up. He told me everything I did. You see, you see church, you know why? Only Jesus can do that. You know, some people play Jesus on the church board. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you know why Jesus can do that? Jesus is a scientist. He's a scientist with a capital S. He does not engage like modern scientists do in hypothesis. He doesn't play around with 
uh, with conjecture. He doesn't have to deal by testing, by trial and error. I declare unto you in your life that Jesus is a scientist with a capital S. He's an analyst. He can evaluate me critically and he can do it quickly. He knows every corner, every crack and crevice of our wicked hearts. He knows all that we do. He hears all that we say, even in secret. Jesus is a scientist. And you know, one of the reasons why some of us do not want to become Christians and commit to him is because we do not want to be exposed to his scrutinizing eye. You know, but Jesus can read us, and then he can read us quickly. We might as well submit to him because he's going to read us someday regardless. He's a great reader. I don't need anybody to inform me when I've done wrong. No judge, no jury to declare me guilty. The master knows me better than anybody else. Oh, church of the living God, hear me today. Jesus can inspect you and enfrock you and judge you before you're able to say good morning. One day, one day, he looked at Peter. And Peter saw himself. After Peter had denied Jesus three times, Peter saw himself clearly. For his life was mirrored in the eyes of Jesus. And the Bible says that all Peter can do is to go out and weep bitterly. Jesus saw demons in people that people themselves didn't see or couldn't see. New life, Jesus, can read you with all the games that we play. So that once woman's story is a simple story. Simple storyline. I went to Jacob's well. I met Jesus, young people, at Jacob's well. He read me. He saw through me. He told me everything that I ever did. He looked inside of me. He opened me up. And he caused my mouth to confess. He fixed me up. You all better come and see this man who told me everything I ever did. And you know what happened, church? It was like those boys in Capsabet, the Nandi boys, it was like the Olympics. They started running to Jacob's well. Men ran, women rushed, children dashed, Samaria became alive, the city caught on evangelistic fire, all because of one woman's witness. Well, you like. What Jesus did for her, he can do for you today. Come on and say amen. amen. Yes, he can. I'm glad that she didn't keep it to herself. I'm glad that our experience was so salvific, so saving, so liberating. That she could not keep it in. I'm glad, so glad that she told it all over Samaria. So I want to have, before I sit down, I want to have a conversation with this woman of Samaria. Can I have a conversation with her? Come here, woman of Samaria, in 2022. I know that he liberated you. Woman of Samaria. Tell me, what else did he do for you? Well, she said, Brother Pastor Parkinson, the first thing he did. Are you sitting down? Put on your seatbelts. The first thing he did, he eradicated my prejudice. If you can't say amen, say ouch. He showed me that Jews and Samaritans and all people whether they be Jews or Gentiles Protestants or Catholics Americans or Bolivians Canadians or Dominicans English or 
Flemish. Russians are Ukrainians. Angolans are Mozambicans. Malawians are Ghanaians. Namibians are Lesotho people. Botswana are Swazis. Sierra Leone's are South Africans. Zambians are Zimbabweans. Botswana are Kosa. Africans are Pedi. Zulu or Zuhu, Kisi, Mikenda, Miyakenda, Masai, Luo, Luo, Kalenjin, Kikuyu, Luya, come on now, Kamba, Samburu, Turkana, Kenyans, Somalians, Ugandans, Tanzanians, Adventists, Presbyterians, we're all people of one God. Yes! Hallelujah, yes. Yes. It shouldn't take a crisis, a political crisis to divide a church. And every Adventist church I know, any part of the world, gets into the same problems. Folk, we got to get it together. In heaven, there's no division. In heaven, there's no prejudice. Come on, church! No culture! Christ came and made one culture, Christian culture. And all the ground is level. At the foot of the cross. Are you listening to me? God wants a group of people who want to act like Christians. I will follow thee, my Savior, wheresoever my lot may be. Sing it with me. Where thou go. Yes, I will follow. Yes, I'll follow. I will follow. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me. And all men will forsake thee. And though all men may forsake thee. Yet my grace I'll follow thee. One second. I live in South Africa now. I'm married to South Africa. Southern Africa. Two of my children are Zimbabweans, born in Zimbabwe. The oldest one, born in America. I have nephews, born in Barbados. I can't afford to be prejudiced. Are you listening to me? Yes. I can't, I'll be pre for don't let the devil use election time to divide you. Vote for Jesus and he will set things right. He's able. He's able. Do you believe he's able? Yes, he is. He died for you. He died for you. And I thank God for you. I thank God that this was a peaceful election. I thank God. You've become a disciplined people in the last time I was here. I thank God for you. But go and serve Jesus. You ain't heavy, you're my brother. You're my sister. Sing it. I will follow Second stanza. Second stanza. Second stanza. Second stanza. Second stanza. Second stanza. Though the road, let's go. Though the road be rough and thorny, Rockless hearts the foggy sea, The strongest is way before me, And I gladly follow thee. I will follow, I will follow. I will follow thee, my Savior. Thou didst shed thy blood for me. And the woman should for 
tell you something racism nationalism regionalism tribalism all those are sinful practices and where I have lived in eight countries worked in seven and wherever I run into black people we are divided whether it's, whether it was in Zimbabwe, America, because in America, African Americans don't like Caribbeans and Africans. Hello. We all black, yes. When I was in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe didn't like Malawians and Zambians. In South Africa now, it's, they didn't have a new word for racism, xenophobia. All that is sin. With a capital S. It's just as bad as adultery or lying and stealing and corruption. You can't go to heaven if you hate your brother or your sister because they are of a different ethnic group. You can't go to heaven. God can't trust us in heaven. You don't need another Lucifer up there. Come on, church! Though the road be rough and thorny, somebody come to Jesus today. Drag us Let's all stand. The, the form we see. Thou was trod the way before me. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. You want to give your heart to Jesus today. You want to be a champion. You want to be a leader. You want to be a leader, a cultural leader. Come, 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 come. Come to meet me on the stage. Come. Thou didst shed thy blood for me. You want to be a leader for Jesus, like that woman at the well. Come see a man. They sing the next stanza. That woman, you know she had problems, but she did not allow her problems to camouflage her witness or to interfere with her witness. And the Bible says that the whole city, the whole city became Christians. It can happen here. You could be that witness. Come, come, come. Sing the last stanza. Come, join me up front. You, you could be that witness. Somebody wants to be Jesus' witness. Come, as we begin this camp meeting, you want to demonstrate true Christianity. The third stanza. Though I meet with tribulation. Meet with tribulation, come. Solitary. Come, just step out your seat and come. Young man, young woman, hold the person. Come. I want to pray with you and for you. Come. Take one step. One step. Come. God bless you. God bless you. Come, come. And the little child shall lead him. Come. Come. You want to be a champion. You want to be a witness for Jesus. By thy grace. I will follow. I will follow. Jesus, I'm coming to Jesus. Don't let your pride hold you back. Come. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You want to be different. Come. 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 Today. Come. Young man, young woman, come. Come, come to Jesus today. Be that witness through your neighborhood. By thy grace. Come. I'm not calling you to me, I'm calling you to Christ. Come. Come. God bless you, sir. It wasn't easy. God bless you. 
God bless you. God bless you. Come. Come. You want to be a witness for Jesus. God bless you, sir. God bless you. I will follow. I will follow. Don't allow your pride to stop in your way. Come. Come. You want to be a witness for Christ. Is it your desire to be a witness wherever you are, your community? When a conversation comes up about another group that does not look like yours, you will stop it in the track. You will be a witness like that woman of Samaria. If that's your desire, put your hand up where you are. God sees your hand. God sees your heavenly Father, we thank you. For your power to change, your power to liberate, your power to turn somebody around. Oh, Father, we thank you that at the beginning of this encampment, that you can take up permanent residence. We invite you in, Lord. Everything that happens here must be Christ centered. Oh, God, we give our hearts to you one more time. Empower us. Whenever the devil comes, oh, Father, and try, to circumvent your witness. Beat him back. Beat him back, dear Father. For you're stronger than he is. We can't match him, Lord, but you can. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, before I'm done, this afternoon, my message will be entitled, Call to be saints. Call to be saints. By the way, I couldn't preach this whole message. Do you know why the, why the disciples send the devils to buy groceries? Tell me some other time. God bless you. <laughs>